in our second video about the shape and space measurement specific outcome one for the 2016 edition of Alberta's grade nine math, we are going to be showing that the measure of the central angle is equal to twice the measure of the inscribed angle subtended by the same arc of a circle. That's certainly a whole lot of words that we haven't used very often. So let's go through and make sure we understand what all those definitions are. So first, we have a circle. Uh, let's make it a little closer to the center here. Now, and in the angle that's inscribed is different from the central angle. So a central angle is one from two points on the surface of a circle that go to the center. An inscribed angle will be from those same two points to a third point on the circle. We're going to actually have to deal with three cases to do the proof. So there's a case that we have with trying this ABCD construction where the central angle is completely contained within the inscribed angle. We are going to have another case where the chord is only partly inscribed. So some of it will actually continue right through the center, parallel and coming out the other side. So we do have this case where you know, the chord is essentially a diameter and then we have another angle coming off it. And then the third case we are going to set up is going to be a case where there's actually intersections between the two lines. So again, we have our central angle here, but then our inscribed angle is going to be off to the side of our circle. So that our central angle, it, you know, the line, one of the lines out of our central angle is cut or intersected, not necessarily bisected, but intersected by one of the other lines. These are the three setups that we have to get through. Now, this circle here on the right is going to be the one we do first. That one, this EFGH construction, where we have a diameter of the circle is actually the easiest case to prove. So we'll start with it like this. We will have our inscribed angle going as a diameter. And we can pick our other line to be anywhere on the right. That is going to come back to our center. So now we are going to label our angles. Let's say the inscribed angle is alpha. If I can get the zooming to stop. We know that sometimes it likes to do that. So this, he said we were going to call alpha. And we'll call our central angle in this case, beta. So we want to try to prove that beta is exactly two times alpha. So how are we going to do that? One way to do that is by recognizing that this piece of our line here is a radius. And this line here is also a radius because they are both connecting points on the outside of the circle to the center of the circle. That means we have an isosceles triangle. And that means that this angle here is also angle alpha. And with an isosceles triangle, these sides have to be equal. So now we're really getting somewhere. 
with this isosceles triangle and the fact that this is a diameter, we could take this center angle and express it in two ways. We know that 2 alpha plus theta has to add up to 180 degrees because this is a triangle. We also know that beta plus theta have to add up to 180 degrees because this diameter is a straight line. So comparing these two equations, they are identical except for this. If we want to do it in complete detail, we could say, well, since they're both equal to 180, 2 alpha plus theta is equal to beta plus theta. And then I could just use algebra to cancel the thetas. Gives us 2 alpha equals beta. That's what we are trying to prove. The central angle is the inscribed angle times 2. So that proves that this is true in this case. Right now we've only proven it in the case where we have a diameter, but it has proven it in this one particular case. Now the next case we're going to prove is the one drawn by that ABCD that we had here. And we're going to do it by putting in a line. So we take this point and connect it to the center. And this will now divide our triangle into two cases that we have already solved. So doing it a little more clearly, we have this case, we have our central angle, and then we have our inscribed angle coming in somewhere here, not necessarily centered. But when we take a line from where the inscribed angle intersects the circle through the center, we have essentially just built two versions of the proof we just did. We now have, if I pick the correct tool, on the left, we have a case where this angle, we'll call it alpha one, must be related to beta one by saying beta one is two alpha one because that's the case with the inscribed and central angles with a common diameter. We can do the same thing for the construction on the right. We now have an alpha two here and a beta two here. So beta two must be two alpha two. Putting that all together, this total central angle is beta one plus beta two, while the total inscribed angle is gonna be alpha one plus alpha two. But beta one is two alpha one, beta two is two alpha two. So on the left, we have beta, because beta one plus beta two is beta. On the right, we can factor out a two, get us two times alpha one plus alpha two, but since alpha one plus alpha two is alpha, that completes the proof of this case. So when our central angle is completely enclosed within our inscribed angle, we've got that proof. When they share a side and that's on the diameter, we've got that proof. So now the only other proof we need to do is the case for when our central angle We'll try to draw that one nice and straight in the middle here. So there's our central angle, the case where the inscribed angle is so far to the side that we have an intersection, not necessarily a bisection, but an intersection between these two, where we have an angle beta here and an angle alpha here. 
This is the third and final case we'll need to prove. So for our first step, we'll use a trick that has been reliable before. So far, every case we have solved, we have solved with a diameter. So we will put another diameter here. And now we have a case we will call this tiny little angle, alpha 1, and this slightly less tiny angle, beta 1. Because these are these angles in here subtending this arc. So based on what we know already, we can immediately say beta 1 is 2 alpha 1 because these are the subtended arcs that share this diameter. But now we have another arc. It comes right from here, from that diameter to this ending point there. So from what we've seen before, beta plus beta 1 must equal 2 times this total angle here of alpha plus alpha 1. We can now combine these two statements. So beta, now our beta 1 is equal to 2 alpha 1. We've done that substitution there. So we take our 2 alpha 1, substitute it for beta 1, and we get this term in brackets. We distribute through on the right, we have 2 alpha plus 2 alpha 1. And then our 2 alpha 1s that appear on both sides cancel. And we are left with beta equals 2 alpha. So that now shows that these middle pieces, this arc, works. And I realize only now in this final step that I keep using the word subtend without actually defining it, because that was listed in the curriculum as well. So if an angle subtends an arc, it means a certain uh, relationship exists. So if we have that circle, and we have this line, then angle alpha will subtend so alpha subtends arc S, where S is the arc we draw here. So if you think of this point as a spotlight, and it's shining a light on the inside of the circle, but not on any other parts, so we can see the light where it's shining, but somehow it still manages not to reflect, even though that wouldn't work because it has to reflect to our eyes if we can see it. But if you imagine this as a spotlight, the light that is not reflected on the inside of the circle, that space that gets unreflected light, that is the arc that is subtended by that spotlight angle alpha. So that's the definition of the word subtends. And with these three cases combined, we can prove that for any arc like that, for any angle, when it we also have an angle to the middle subtending the same arc, then the central angle beta is going to be twice the size of angle alpha.